As great power competition in Africa heats up, Germany's chancellor says it's time for her own country's firms to take a new look at the continent's economic opportunities. To that end, she invited heads of state from 12 African countries to Berlin this week. Her initiative, Compact with Africa, foresees a mutually beneficial deal. If African governments promote reform, Germany will promote investment. But will the private sector play along? Do firms have enough trust to take the leap? Economic upswing in Africa. Who really profits? That's our topic. And here to debate the risks and opportunities of Germany's Africa strategy is Veya Tata. She is a computer scientist with roots in Cameroon and serves as the editor-in-chief of the magazine Africa Positive. She says the compact with Africa primarily serves the interests of Western investors. It's also a pleasure to welcome Iman Seifelden. She's a human rights activist from Sudan who's been living in Germany since 2016. She says the investment and trade provisions should be based on partnership and not on superiority. And I'm very pleased to welcome my colleague from DW's Africa desk, Daniel Peltz, who has reported from numerous African countries over the past 12 years. He says, unless African governments and international partners do their part, the poor will be left out with dire consequences. So let me start with you, Veatata, and ask you about the first part of our title, namely economic upswing. We often hear there's a lot more good news coming out of Africa than the Western media typically report. Now, with a magazine entitled Africa Positive, I guess you're trying to change that. Can something like this initiative, the Compact with Africa, and this conference that was held this week, can they shift the narrative on Africa? Um, I think uh, for the meantime, yeah, in Germany, yeah, but I think after a few weeks, people are going to forget about it because I think uh, the, the narratives about Africa has to be constantly repeated in the society so that we can change the way uh, the German companies uh, see Africa development because normally now in the German uh, narrative, Africa is mostly associated with aid you know, with uh, donations, you know, and, and, not with uh, and not with economic development. And I think uh, that's the narrative that is very important because that's what is going to show uh, the companies here uh, or the investors here uh, that there is a lot in this continent, you know, like uh, instead of only concentrating on the raw materials and on the oil, I mean, we have a lot of potentials. We have a lot of young, talented uh, uh, entrepreneurs, but they need capital. They need uh, investment capital, both from their government and both from investors, uh, foreign direct investors. But I think the Compact with Africa doesn't really address these issues. Yes, in fact, so you said uh, in your opening statement, it yes. serves the interests of Western investors. But yes. doesn't Western investment generate jobs? Doesn't it uh, create a climate that leads to growth? But not with this initiative in the way I see it, because uh, if you look at it critically, uh, it focuses on large-scale investment, you know, uh, but most of the companies, uh, or most of the little, uh, small and medium-sized companies in African countries are mostly informal, you know, and they really need a lot of capital. Maybe not this very large, but they need maybe small capital in order for them to, like, uh, grow, you know, and those are the companies that are going to create jobs because they are local companies. But when you look at Compact with Africa, it focuses on the big guys, you know, and they are going to come with their pension funds, you know, to invest so that they can make much more, um, uh, this, <laughs> much more uh, profit, you know, but we need investment that is going to go at the bottom of the pyramid that is going to create more jobs in the society. Similar to yeah. what Daniel Peltz said in his uh, opening statement, he said that uh, we need to make sure that growth and investment benefit the poor. You've been reporting, as I said, from Africa for some years now. What are the main obstacles that in fact hinder that from happening? Well, I think one issue is what guidelines are in place to really make sure that the local people benefit. I remember uh, visiting a project in rural Sierra Leone where a Western company came and I think even backed with, uh, with 
funds from Western development organizations to set up a, a plantation uh, to uh, produce palm oil locally. But the problem is they were only hiring locals as unskilled workers and they were given a job for maybe one month, for maybe three months and then that was it. They were out of the job. They were not earning salaries that were really helping them to turn their lives around, to send their kids to school or maybe to invest, for example, by building a house and then, you know, paying a local company so that you see the money is actually going and stimulating economic growth. So for me, it's, it's really an issue about what guidelines do we have in place. So the compact and the conference talked a lot about reform. Would you say that they do take some steps to addressing those problems? I am very doubtful. Um, there, it always sounds as if many people believe it's only a matter of bringing more private investment to Africa and then it will be a self-starter. I do not really see that people take this into account. Iman Seferden, you said investment and trade base, uh, must be based on mutual respect. So the compact and also the conference that was just hosted, they are explicitly foreseeing reform partnerships. Would you say that meets your demand? Uh, I guess no, because um, the Compact with Africa strategies uh, and policies that uh, uh, very much depend on um, uh, on the uh, debts and loans that uh, in uh, that will end up in empowering the African people, because um, uh, we are always taking uh, the international the IOs the international organizations. Uh, recipes that uh, we have to lift this uh, the, the the subsistence or, or the the um, the help on the basic needs of the of the poor people like in health sector or education sector then uh, after years, you find the country is uh, having a lot of burden of these debts on shoulder and we are still on the same circle of government uh, of poverty uh, that's why I think uh, Compact with Africa is not meeting the demands of Africans. Rather more, it, uh, the, 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 the Compact with Africa, it's an investment strategy and uh, economical development that uh, needs to provide chances for young people to work, more jobs. But when we look deep, these investments are not tar targeting education and absolutely not uh, vocational training that is very much needed for uh, for for Af for work market and uh, when we don't have skilled workers or we cannot meet the demand of these markets then we need then the investors will rely on somebody from outside and that is why it opened chances for western people not for the african people and uh, if I take uh, Sudan as an example, although Sudan is not part of the uh, compact with Africa, but there is lots of policies and strategies that have been made specifically to Sudan, as in Marshall and Khartoum process and different other, and rock process, lots of processes coming from European Union towards Sudan. But the beneficiaries are not the Africans or the nation, the Sudanese people. And instead, these policies have been very much wrong or very much negative impact in our country. Let's delve a little bit deeper on what the compact foresees in terms of reform partnerships. One partnership with Senegal was being showcased at this week's conference. Let's hear what leaders from both sides had to say. Whether it's about peace, climate protection, economic development, migration or other big issues of our times, we all agree that with over 50 countries and a growing population, especially a young population, Africa is playing an important role in solving global problems. The compact actually will help the government and all the stakeholders to implement reforms that will improve our ranking for the ease of doing business. So, after Africa, the growth continent of the future, we're building our partnership on an equal footing, a win-win situation for both sides. Let me go to you, Veya Tata. We heard the Senegalese minister there talking about the reform partnership. 
Would you agree that a partnership like this one can, in fact, promote effective reform? Are there concrete steps that you would say they are helpful? Well, there are some concrete steps uh, in this uh, initiative compact with Africa, but I think uh, that's not really the, the problems uh, that are really affecting the economic development of many African countries that are involved in this uh, compact with Africa. Uh, we should look at um, uh, the foundation of the stagnation of economic development in African countries. And you see, when you look at it critically, it's also because of the colonial uh, connections that most of these countries have with European countries. And also, if you look at, uh, like, for example, you see France, the role France plays in many African countries, you know, with the monetary uh, uh, decisions that have been taken in these countries, everything is being controlled by France. So it means a lot of African countries are not independent. And if a country is not independent, it cannot carry out its development uh, uh, decisions on its own because somebody is always involving him, his or herself inside. So I think Africans, Africans themselves, they have to look for a way to break away from these chains that are preventing the African countries from developing. And the most important thing for me is to see how we can use our resources that we have back home to add value to products before we export them uh, out of the continent, because that would be the only way that we are going to create a lot of employment for the youth. Because if we don't produce what, what we consume as Africans, we are going to have the same problems. And these initiatives, they are not going to solve our problems. Iman Sajazan, yes. how much interest do African leaders themselves or at least many African leaders themselves, really have in reform. Aren't there many who themselves profit, literally profit, from perpetuating the status quo? Uh, of course, not only the Africans that are profiting from perpetuating of the, this um, African nation or uh, elongation of these sufferings of the African nations. It's uh, the Western countries are also the same thing. They favor to have such kind of weak and um, corrupt uh, leaders in, in the top of the hierarchy of uh, African continents. That is because of so many things, that the money laundry issues and so many economical, big economical issues that going on. Uh, arms market that is also flourishing in Africa. The, and um, I think coming back to, um, to her point that uh, uh, it, we really need to look uh, in a critical way to uh, compact with Africa. If the partners, the European partners, really, really apply the compact with Africa, uh, if we are looking not only to France, France is really controlling and having. A I want to come back way. in a moment and, to the role and, about and other UK, outside powers. But, mm -hmm. yeah. And UK also, UK Sorry. also is having. Like, talk to us a little bit more about. African leadership itself. In, let's not only talk about pressure from outside, yeah. but let's talk about what is generated on corruption from inside. Okay, I give you an example of Sudan, because I am coming from Sudan, I know it. Uh, we were struggling against the Bashir regime, that um, corrupt regime that committed the crimes against humanity and genocide in the country for so long time. Whenever the regime is weak, whenever there is no any um, uh, economical flows of money or banking or anything, we got uh, money comes from Europe in such of ki kind of projects like Simple Khartoum project. That is in 2017, we, we had a very good uprise People were on demonstration on, on the roads to 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 oust the Bashir regime, but its uh, Khartoum process has started, and millions of dollars, millions of uh, of euros have been invested in this government so that to stabilize the system that uh, really corrupt and that really sustain the sufferings of Africans, and uh, plus um, a project that have been initiated to hinder the influx of migrants to Europe, that Khartoum process. Uh, within this context, lots of huge money have been uh, getting its way to, to corrupt militias and government. So uh, even if uh, the nations, the Africans have the will to break down this vicious circle of, um, of, uh, of suffer, but uh, we have external factors that affect our, our will and our uh, our ambitions of having good governance in the country. That's right. so, 
Daniel, uh, I posed that question in a rather generalized way, saying most African leaders. But in fact, there are wide discrepancies, aren't there? Now, the compact includes a couple of countries that are often seen as beacons, Ethiopia and Rwanda. On the other hand, it also includes Egypt, which surely is not noted for its interest in breaking the status quo. Uh, how do you figure that? Uh, does that make sense for you? Well, I think even the two beacons, Rwanda and Ethiopia, are often criticized, especially for the human rights record. Ethiopia is also grappling with uh, internal conflicts where also the government has come under fire. Um, so I think uh, these countries were chosen according to economic uh, interests, but good governance apparently was not the primary factor uh, to determine which countries could be part of the Compact with Africa initiative. And I think uh, that is a great mistake. I think you also need to promote good governance. But what governance. countries would you want to include then? Isn't this sort of, uh, it seems to me all of you are to some degree arguing it's all or nothing. Don't we need to move step by step? And aren't there countries where you do see some potential for cooperation on trade and investment possibly beginning to change the dynamics? Or the you rule that out dynamics? altogether? Yeah. Um, I don't really see that the political dynamics in these countries are changing. I think it actually helps uh, the leaders to remain in power if they have good relations with the West, if development aid is flowing, or if you even have cooperation in the security sector, for instance, as it was the case with, with Sudan, as you right. mentioned. Uh, yeah. I think there is even a, a certain danger, although I understand the Western interests to cooperate with these governments, but uh, I think it is also a, 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 a dangerous situation because you might help governments to, to remain in power despite a very bad human rights record. So taking this to an extreme, are you suggesting African countries would be better off if the flows stopped? My, I, I think that's the opinion that I always uh, propagate because I think um, if African countries uh, can concentrate on the internal struggles that they have, because we have a lot of internal struggles, and most of these are very complex, you know, because uh, they also come from these structures that we inherited from the colonial time. So I think yeah. the first thing is we have to sit together within our countries and maybe with, with the neighboring countries and look for ways and solutions of tackling these internal struggles. And if we do, then you, then you are going to see that the inter-African trade is going to increase because we Africans, we have to trade with each other. We don't have to focus our mind on Europe, you know? And those are the things that I think if we start step by step, solving the right problems, then we won't be sitting here and talking about initiatives that are coming from Europe, from, from Russia, from China, you know, to come and save Africa. No, we have to save ourselves. Nobody's but going to still, save us. Uh, still, I think in the, in the issue of investment, uh, if we, uh, any investor will not favour to have any money in a country that is un politically unstable. And this instability, this situation is very much related to the policies of European Union. That's right. So uh, I think either those people are throwing money on nothing, because I don't, I don't believe in sustainability of long term. Uh, these projects will not be sustained for long term uh, conditions or years. Uh, rather more, there will be destruction, destruction somehow to these projects by the instability, uh, investing in war, investing in militias, investing right. in uh, sustaining the indemocratic uh, systems in our countries. So all these kind of things that will not generate or will not make favor let me, let me of the investors to let put their money in an, there. Uh, let me bring in another short report that we have and see whether uh, I can provoke you a little <laughs> bit um, because it purports to tell a positive story. Uh, Germany launched the compact in 2017 during its presidency of the G20 group of industrialized and developing countries. Foreign investment in the partner countries to the compact has risen since then, albeit modestly. Most of the increase, though, has gone to just four countries, Egypt, Morocco, Ethiopia, and Ghana. Let's take a closer look at one story. Accra. Over 2.3 million people live in Ghana's capital, with more coming in every day. Even now, the city is short around 2 million apartments. Construction is going ahead full capacity. 
The potential was great enough for German drywall maker Knopf to open a branch in Ghana. But even the best materials are useless if nobody knows how to handle them. And our target is to equip local personnel in the building and construction industry to gain employment, basically, to earn a livelihood. With assistance from the German GEZ Development Agency, the company set up a training center. 350 young people have already completed training here. Architects, civil engineers, and tradesmen. Thousands more are expected to follow. Can this set an example for other African countries? So let me put that question straight away to Daniel, but with this uh, preface to the question. We heard the chancellor uh, in the report before mm -hmm. talking about migration. It is pretty easy to conclude that a lot of this is all about migration. Many African countries have huge youth populations, not enough jobs to go around. There is a lot of pressure on young people to go somewhere else where mm -hmm. the opportunities are better. Can a project like that one that we just saw make a difference? Yes, I think. And uh, I think the compact also has a potential because, I mean, every country, every continent also needs, needs economic ties with the rest of the world. I mean, nobody can survive um, alone. So I think also the compact uh, um, has potential because infrastructure projects, um, for instance, the idea to improve energy supply also helps to stimulate local growth and that in turn can create jobs for the young people that are there that are in dire need of jobs and also macroeconomic um, reforms like countries that are part of the compact have to keep inflation at bay. They have to make sure that their, bud their budget deficits remain within certain limits that of course can also help local business. So I think, yeah, there is also some potential in the, in the compact as well. Vija Tata, um, let me ask you this, uh, because we're seeing a lot of interest in Africa uh, in other areas of the world. Russia held its own uh, summit on Africa just a few weeks ago. China is deeply engaged in many African countries. India expanding its own trade and investment with Africa. Do these countries, by attaching fewer strings to their support, offer more partnership and do more for young people and the poor than, for instance, Germany? Uh, well, let's be realistic. Each of these countries has its own interest. No country will be going to Africa just because they are going there for friendship. It's all interest. They're just doing the same thing that the European countries are doing. But, I mean, we should look at the form. What are the African countries doing? They should be the people to set the pace. They should be the people to, to set the right uh, measures that are going to profit their own population. So up to now, I think the problem has been most of our governments don't set the right measures that profit the majority of the population. And why is it that? She said before that most of these governments, they are, they are supported by, by, by foreign powers and foreign multinationals. And we have to deal with that. Because if we don't deal with that, we can we'll continue to see this cycle repeating and repeating. And for me, I think the African youths, at the moment, they are saying we want to profit from the resources on the continent. We want to have perspective in our continent. We don't really need to go out, but our government have to be responsible in the first place to us and not to foreign investors. But we need investors, but it doesn't mean we have to take all type of investors that are coming to Africa. Mm. Iman Seifeld and German development NGOs and some international ones as well, say that German support and, and international support should be linked to very clear human rights and environmental standards. Would you yourself, also working with an NGO, agree with that? And would you say it's still feasible given the presence of nations like China and Russia that attach fewer conditions to their support? I actually, one of the major critics on the compact with Africa is that the lack of environmental issues in the programs, uh, which is now climate change is a, a very, um, very serious issue in the Horn of Africa and in North Sub-Saharan Africa, where a very serious drought that hits the uh, Lake of Chad and where the, uh, the, the European Union is very much interested. Uh, I think without tackling these issues, um, nothing is going to be, uh, we are still living in one continent and we are affecting each other. Uh, and uh, one planet also. So climate issues is, is fairest. Human rights is rather more 
on top of the agenda because uh, most of the most of the lo loans and um, subsidies that the African government gets it goes corruptedly in or invested in in uh, in a way or another in uh, abuse of human beings like what is happening in uh, combating migration issues that is a very serious issue for me that what i have seen in um, in uh, the cooperation between uh, between germany and and libyan board uh, guards where the the refugees have been kept in in detentions in the very serious conditions and in human um, aspect very quick answer, Daniel Peltz, if you would. I want to come back to our title, Economic Upswing in Africa, Who Really Benefits? What's your answer? Well, I think at the moment much more needs to be done to make sure that the poor really benefit. At the moment, it's not a self-starter to make sure that the poor are really going to benefit. Thank you. Thank you to all of you for being with us today. And thanks to all of you out there for tuning in. See you soon.